Well, welcome everybody uh, to the uh, Finance and Investment Committee of the Vallecitos Water District on Monday, December 21st at 4 p.m. Hey, you guys wanna go? Oh, can you hear me? Oh, via teleconferencing. And uh, we don't need to do a roll call or a call or a, a, a roll call for this meeting. So we'll go ahead and jump right into the discussion items. I'll turn it over to you, Glenn. All right. So um, can you guys see the screen I just shared? Yes. Director Boyd Hodgson, can you? Yes, I, I'm sorry. It just takes me a minute to get to my mute button. Yeah, yes, okay. I can see it. That's fine. Um, so this is, the, you can see the, uh, the items for the discussion. There's actually a bit of a, a disconnect between us and uh, it, it being posted. There's really only one item for discussion. It's item one, budget overview. The other two are supposed to be attachments that were sent to you. And there was a mix up in the communication. So I think the uh, attachments did get sent later this afternoon or earlier this afternoon. But for our per meeting purposes, it's one big discussion about the budget overview. So just uh, to clarify that. Yeah. Get a mask and get Bobby, please. Get a mask and get Bobby. Um, clear that. So maybe just, I'm gonna, Wes is actually gonna run the meeting for the most part. And what he's gonna do, he's gonna use a presentation that we used during the budget uh, development. Um, for both of your purposes, this is intended to be just a really broad overview of the budgetary process. Um, you may have a lot of questions that come out of this meeting, and I'm gonna suggest that those would be good topics for future finance committee meetings or for informa informational meetings with directors Boyd Hodgson and Pennock. I think there's some information and some work that we can do kind of uh, outside of the scope of the finance committee meeting that would help our two newest directors get up to the basic level of budgetary understanding that our existing or our returning board members have. So not to say that there aren't opportunities to ask questions here, but uh, keeping in mind that this was intended to be a, a really high level overview that will hopefully spark thought and maybe help generate a list of future finance committee topics. So with that, unless there's any uh, general questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Wes and he's gonna jump in with the bulk of the conversation. So Wes, go ahead. Mm. Okay, let's see if I can keep it going this time after slide three. Mm. Uh, so yeah, as a gentleman mentioned, it's gonna be a uh, financial overview tonight. And I was thinking of the best way to do that. <clears throat> and I think honestly, the best way would be to go over the budget process, which is why we're doing a budget overview tonight. The budget is really the driving document for almost everything finance related at the district. So, <clears throat> so we'll go through that process. And this will be sort of an overview slash preview of what's to come over the next six months. So tonight we're gonna to talk about, uh, first the budget process and calendar. Uh, we'll go through the timeline for it. It's pretty much the same every year. Uh, changes maybe based on you know uh, board member schedules or uh, and meeting dates, stuff like that. But overall, it's pretty much the same. And we're gonna use, we'll take a look at last year's, but again, it should be similar. And then we'll look at the, like a broad overview of the operating expenses. We're not necessarily gonna dive into the numbers themselves, but come show you how we come up with the the numbers, what the process is for getting those. We'll do the same thing for the salaries and benefits. Then Mike will talk about water sales, purchases, and sewer revenue. Then I'll go over the capital budget process. And finally, I'll talk about the reserve balances in our five-year projections. So this is the budget process and calendar. <clears throat> if you've seen the the budget presentation at the board meetings, you've seen this several times before, but on the left side is our internal process, what we're working on in-house, and on the right side talks about the, the meetings we'll have and what we'll be discussing at finance committee meetings, board workshops, or board meetings. So we really start, uh, we started like last month to be, to be honest. Uh, I started entering the actuals from the audit, and then we started looking at the new system we're gonna be using for the budget this year. And Ed and his guys in operations started getting quotes and, and started putting together the materials requests. But uh, technically the requests aren't due until the end of February. So in February, we really collect the uh, department's requests and we update the budget document with the audited actuals for 2020. 
And then last year we met on March 2nd with the finance committee. Sometimes we'll meet like mid, mid February. Um, <clears throat> it just worked out last year was the beginning of March. So usually we'll have a meeting in February, maybe a meeting in March. Um, but we met March 2nd, went over the budget process, did this very presentation. So you'll get to see this many times in the future. So if you have questions, you can ask them now or you can ask them later. There's plenty of information. Um, <clears throat> and we went over the, the budget to actual for the last five years to see how we've done over the last five years and more specifically look at how we did in the current year actual versus budget. Internally, we'll be compiling the operating draft budget. We'll start putting it together. And then we start looking at the fiscal year 2020 projections. We typically have up to March 31st at that point. So we'll project the next three months. And we do the same thing for payroll. We'll take nine months of payroll, project that out for another three months to get the 12 month projections. And then in the second meeting in March, we bring that to the finance committee to talk about those requests and the projections and get feedback from the committee and any suggestions they may have. So then looking at April, internally, we take all the suggestions from the committee, changes, recommendations, and anything else we discussed, and we'll incorporate those into the operating budget. And then we begin to prepare the draft capital budget. Uh, we also start working on the, <clears throat> or I start reviewing the draft capital budget, and we start looking at preliminary payroll estimates. And then on April 13th, we'll bring the preliminary salary and benefits to the finance committee, and we start looking at preliminary capital budget requests as well. Hey, Wes, can I interrupt real quick? Sure. So you, you said you gave those dates as if they <clears throat> will be happening. So those are 2020 dates. So were yep. these references to last year's meeting or are these projected meeting dates for going forward? Yeah, sorry. Just to clarify, these are meeting dates. They usually are pretty similar each year. We just like to look at the uh, board members' schedules and say, okay, you know, what, when would you like to meet in February if possible? And we'll set these meetings up. But typically it's one meeting a month, maybe two meetings a month using this same sort of process. Right. So these, these are, are last year that happened last year or this. Yeah, these, these are last year's dates, but we'll be sending out the calendar and talking to the committee probably in February and start to develop the calendar for the current year. So that's what happened in April, end of April last year. Uh, we reviewed the draft operating capital budget and we went over it and then got any suggestions from the committee. And then in May, we started actually typically in May, we would have ha had a draft budget and be preparing it, revising it, refining it to get it to go to the board. Um, but unfortunately, this year we had COVID. Uh, so at that point, we had to basically redo the whole budget and come up with a COVID-19 financial plan. So we don't expect that to happen this year. Hopefully this year, this will be like around the time we just start really trying to fine tune the draft budget in May. And then sometime in May, depending on the dates, um, <clears throat> we'll have a meeting with the finance committee to go over that draft budget. Last year, it was the COVID-19 financial plan. This year, we'll just be taking a look at probably the draft budget and any suggestions. We'll incorporate those items into the budget internally. And then around May 20th, we'll bring that to a, uh, typically a board workshop at that point and present the draft proposed budget. And then anything that comes out of that meeting in June, we usually go back, put it into the budget, incorporate it, and do our final uh, revisions and refining in QAQC to come up with the perfect budget to bring to the board, typically the first week in June. And again, it depends on the board meeting date uh, in June, but that's pretty much the plan for the budget process and calendar with the exceptions of the dates on the right, those will be changing according to schedules. But as you can see, we have plenty of time to work through a lot of information and we have a lot of meetings to go over. And we're always happy to do more because we enjoy these. Uh, but last year we had seven meetings. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's the just overview of, of what the calendar looks like and what you have to look forward to, sort of a preview of what's to come. So next I wanna go over there's my finish line guy that I got to keep in there. He just excites me. He gets me, you know, he's a happy guy. <clears throat> um, so next I want to take a look at the, the operating budget and the components of it, what it's made up of in the process. So we'll kind of take a look at each one and how we develop this summary of the 2021 budget, not necessarily the numbers, but how we came about um, developing the numbers or the areas of the budget. So the first thing I want to mention is the top three items up there. They're actually reserve funded. Uh, what that means basically is that we have to plan for the future for those items. So we need to collect a little bit of excess of revenues over expenses in order to fund reserves to pay for things like capital replacement. 
There, some items are too large and we can't just collect them from ratepayers this year. So we need to make a five-year plan and start to collect in advance of those projects. So the next thing I'd like to look at are the uh, water operating expenses. And that's made up of water operations and water purchases. So this slide summarizes the water operating expenses and the, the budget for 2021 was $42.7 million. Hey Wes. Yes. Did we lose? Yeah, did we lose Director Boyd Hodgson? No, oh, I hope not. Yeah. It looks like she dropped off. Oh. Uh, she is. Oh, there she is. She's, she's reconnecting. All right, are you back with us, Director Boyd Hodgson? I'm trying, I'm having a lot of connectivity issues. Is there a spot that I can go back to for you? No, that's okay, just keep going and I'll, I'll just get the presentation from you. Okay. Okay, so looking at the water operating budget, um, these are the water operating expenses, 42.7 for 2021. And what's really important to note of that is that 70% of the water operating expense budget is for water purchases. And we get the majority of our water from the water authority. So if they raise their rates, we're almost forced to raise rates to our customers because it's such a major impact on our operating expenses. Now what I did wanna note before, and I actually neglected to do so on the previous slide, was that when we begin the budget process, we're a, a, a water and sewer operating entity or water and sewer district. We provide water and sewer services and we know that we have to provide reliable, sustainable services for water and sewer. We also have you know, several years of experience. We have a good idea of what that costs. So since we know what the costs are and we can look at that and see specifically what we need for the year to collect and we don't collect any addition, nothing in excess, we look at that amount and we set rates based on that to collect only what we need from our customers based on our necessary costs. So <clears throat> that being said, that was should, should have been mentioned in my previous slide, um, but now looking at water operations, if 70% of that is from water purchases, we have to fund that. We don't have a choice, so that can have a major impact on our rates. If we look at the remaining costs here, the remaining 30% is $12.7 million. And that's made up of $8.9 million of salaries and benefits and $3.8 million of materials and services. So materials and services is a really small component of the, of the overall operating expenses. But let's take a look at how we get to the materials and services number of $3.8 million. So for water, materials and services, this was the, uh, the sheet that I sent out a couple hours ago and I apologize for sending it out so late. Um, there was a miscommunication. Um, but we're not really going to dive into the numbers. I know I can see them on the screen. It looks like a lot of numbers. It's just used for reference, really. So if you want to follow along on those or just pay attention to the screen, either way should should work okay. Um, but this is the materials and services request, and it's a little snippet of it, a little example. And we can see in this that when we start the process, all the supervisors get together and they start getting quotes from vendors on what it's going to cost for items they need every year. Uh, and they put it together in this sheet and they submit it to their department manager. That's reviewed, reviewed by the department manager and he decides whether they need it or not and they go through all the items individually. And you can see here, we have a column that lists who's requesting each item. And then in addition, we also have another column that shows that whether they're recurring or not. And the majority of the items in the materials and services are recurring items. So they're year to year, they're the same items. They may change slightly depending on contract prices item costs, stuff like that. But overall, the materials and services are pretty consistent and don't tend to vary too much. So the next, this next little screenshot here is just, I wanna show you how we get from that detailed spreadsheet to the budget document itself. So <clears throat> here's a little snippet of the above. It's just a summary of the water quality materials and supplies. And from there, we take all those little detailed individual items that can be down to like $100 a piece we summarize them and we put them into the budget document. And this is a, again, a small section of page 12 of the budget document, the water quality department. And we can see that the $45,000 for water quality materials and supplies translates over to the budget document into the water quality department, the $45,000 ties out. Just an example of how we get from the, all the detail to the summarized budget document. 
So next, I want to take a look at the sewer, op sewer operations, and it's a similar process to get to the uh, sewer operating costs. But for 2021, sewer operations were 15% of the total budget, or $13.3 million. Taking a look at that in pie chart format, you can see here that 46% of it is in, in green. And why do we break that out? We break that out because that's uh, Encina and Metal Art plant. Encina, as you may or may not know, uh, we own approximately 23% of Encina. So they bill us about 23% of their operating costs on a quarterly basis. And it's pretty, it's pretty much uncontrollable unless I don't think we have a choice whether or not to pay that. So those are really uncontrollable costs from Encina. The other portion of that is Metal Arc plant. Uh, and what we do at Metal Arc is we treat um, reclaimed water and that's our tertiary costs. And we actually bill Carlsbad and Levenhain for those costs. So we're reimbursed for them. So of the $6.1 million, about $4.5 million of that at 34% is for treatment costs that are either from Encina or we will be reimbursed for. So you can see the reclaimed water is 1.5 and Encina was $3 million. So to break that down further for the total operating costs, the remaining 66% <clears throat> or $8.8 .8 million of that, $5.9 million is for salaries and benefits. And then a small portion of the total of $2.9 million is for materials and services. So again, we'll just take a look at the sewer materials and services. Went through this, it's a similar process as I mentioned. We get the materials and services request sheet and this again was attached. It was the sewer, uh, the third sheet attached, I believe. <clears throat> and again, just a section from the vehicles and equipment department. And we can see same thing. We have the supervisor requesting each of the items. There's some items down to $500 here for the Ford scan tool. And the majority of the items again are recurring. So they're requested every year and just updated for the current costs. And then from there, that uh, document is translated into the budget document on page 23. There's the equipment and vehicles department. And we can see that the materials and services of 49,000 translates over into a summarized version of that at 49,000 in the budget document. So that's the sewer operating expenses. Next, I want to take a look at uh, salaries and benefits. So we've done a lot of numbers. Um, so now we're going to do some colors. Uh, <clears throat> this is my colorful graph and you can see the red and yellow are actually represent the budgeted numbers. The blue and green represent the actuals. And the red portion at the bottom are the salaries over the last five years. Uh, salaries have stayed pretty consistent <clears throat> at around, almost, about around $10, $10 million a year. The top portion is for benefits and benefits have ranged from 5.4 to $6.3 million. And overall, over the last five years, we've kept salaries and benefits very consistent. We've done this, uh, <clears throat> we've done this by scrutinizing every position as they become available and just seeing if we need to fill positions. We've also done it by prepaying um, OPEB and prepaying PERS and looking at ways to save money on benefits. And actually, it's worth mentioning that we budgeted $6.3 million for uh, benefits in 2020, and we were able to reduce that down to uh, 5.7. Uh, as a result of pre-funding the PERS. But what I do want to mention is in looking at the salaries and benefits and budgeting for that, we budget it by individual employees. So we look at every employee, their hire date, their pay range. We project out their uh, any raises or steps they might be getting or any colors that are coming to them. So it's really done at a very detailed level. <clears throat> and while we, while we present it at a sort of an overview, we do go down to individual employees and, and departments and it's a really uh, detailed budget. And Wes, before you move on, if I can clarify for Director Boyd Hodgson, uh, Wes mentioned two acronyms, PERS and OPEB. PERS is a public employee's retirement system. That's the retirement plan for our employees. And OPEB stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits. Employees hired prior to July 1 of 2013 were provided with lifetime medical. So even after they retired from the district, they would be provided with medical insurance up until they're eligible for uh, Medicare or Medicaid. So typically around age 65. Employees hired after July 1st, 2013, no longer receive that benefit. So the, the board has taken active steps to control the, uh, the benefits costs here. But so we get, and we won't talk more about it today, but at a future meeting, we can go into greater depth about both PERS and these other post-employment benefits. So back to US. Yeah, and I apologize. I always give these abbreviations. Mike's really, it's Mike's strength in really breaking those out. He's good at doing that. 
uh, <clears throat> I just tend to rumble through them. Um, so that's the salaries and benefits and some information on how we budget for salaries and benefits. And again, we'll get into the detail during those, the finance committee meetings and during the six month long process and exactly what that's made up of. Uh, and this next slide just shows uh, the full-time equivalent employees from 2015 to 2021. And what this really shows is that <clears throat> uh, we've been able to reduce the number of full-time employees from 115.5 down to 108.75 really through just uh, efficient operations and, and like I said, scrutinizing positions and whether we needed them. And, and we've been able to maintain it pretty steadily for the last four years. So next, I think it's Mike's turn. Mike's now gonna talk about water purchases. You're muted, Mike. Okay, so I should be good now. Thanks, Wes. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, Wes. So, um, this is a slide that I showed last week. It just shows our water sales by the um, type of customer. So uh, just to give you a picture of about 70% of our water sales are to residential customers. Wes, if you can go to the next slide, we'll show the um, actual purchases. So Wes mentioned that we do purchase our water from the San Diego County Water Authority, and we do have three sources of water from them. Our desalinated water, which is a contractual obligation to purchase 3,500 acre feet of water per year. Our agreement with OMWD, with OMWD, which is a leave and and that's to purchase 2,750 acre feet of water. That makes up about 20% of our portfolio and quickly our desal makes up about 26% of our portfolio. The remaining water that we need comes from the San Diego County Water Authority. It's about 7,200 acre feet for this current fiscal year for a total projected um, purchase of 13,445 acre feet. Now, all of those sources of water have different costs associated with them. Go ahead, Wes. So our desal water obviously is pretty expensive water. It's almost double the cost of our water authority water. So it's about $2,900 per acre foot. Our agreement with the Levin Hain is um, about $1,350 pretty much. And the remaining water from the water authority is about $1,403. What's important to note though, is that when we do our budget, so when we come up in March, April, May and starting to do our budget, the water authority only has their preliminary budget. So they give us some preliminary numbers that we put into our budget, but they can change before they're adopted by the water authority. And most of the times we adopt our budget either the same day or right before the water authority does. For the most part, the um, amounts that we budget are pretty much in line but there could be something funny going on where for some reason their budget doesn't get approved or something. So just to keep that in mind. So the total cost and, and Wes showed on the previous slide is about um, $29.9 million for our total water purchases that includes the commodity and the fixed amount that's charged by the water authority. So <clears throat> go to the next slide. We use those amounts that we get to um, put in some budget assumptions for the current fiscal year. And we also plan out an additional four fiscal years. So a total of five fiscal years. Now, what we only, ad we only adopt obviously the current fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 2021. So Wes mentioned that the um, water, our purchased water was 70% of our um, expenditures, I believe. And our purchased water came in, the water authority, the net impact of our increase in percentage was about 4.63%. So they increased our purchase water cost by 4.63%. But if you click one more time, Wes. But what we estimated to pass on to the customer was about 3.3%. So our charge to rate payers would go up about 3.3%. For sewer, there were no projected increases for um, fiscal year 2021. So the net overall increase for a customer who has both water and sewer in our district was about 2.3%. And then as Wes mentioned before, we do, go ahead and click one more time, Wes. We do project out for the next four fiscal years. And for the water authority, we assume that the rate increases um, passed on by them to us would be about four to 4.2% each fiscal year. And that because um, it is a huge part, 70% of our costs, we would need to pass on roughly 3.8 to 4% 4, 4 per year to our rate customers. And each year we go through detail, just like Wes mentioned, we go through details on the budgeted line items. We go through detail of every single line item on our purchase water to come up with these amounts. So these are again, just placeholders for right now, to, uh, our best estimates that we had at the time. So Wes, if you can go one more slide. So for this current fiscal year, which we budgeted a couple, six, seven, eight, nine months ago, 
We assume that the rate increase to the customer will go into effect March 1st, 2021. So four months of the fiscal year. If we increase their average bill by about 3.3%, that would mean a increased for us of revenue wise of about 360,000. For the water authority, go ahead and click one more time. The expense portion, their rate of increases go into effect January 1st, 2021. So this in next week, in a week and a half, our rates will increase by about 4.63%. So for that six month time period of this fiscal year, the rate increase would be about $515,000. And you can see that just our rate increase to pass on to the customer, the green portion of 360 versus what we're paying additional $515 already puts us in a hole of about $150,000. What that means is that VWD, our budget is absorbing about $150,000 of rate increases. So the next slide would show the average customer bill. And um, for Director Boyd Hodgson, just to clarify, I'll always say average customer bill. And what we mean, an average customer is a single family residence, abbreviated as SFR. So a single family residence with a five eight inch meter that uses about 13 units of water per month. That's kind of an industry standard when we do um, rate surveys with the other 23 agencies, most, um, agencies define also their average single average customer as a single family residence which, with a five inch inch meter using 13 units of water. So to be kind of consistent with the surrounding area, that's what we use as well. So for this example- I have a quick question. When you, um, when you do that surveying of the other districts, do you publish a document to, you know, for internal use only that shows those comparisons um, so, that, so that we can see sort of how we're compared to other agencies in the area? Absolutely, and we don't do it just internally. We actually publish it out for everyone to see. So the uh, ratepayers can see it and other agencies can see it. And I should um, let you know that more and more other agencies are putting some costs on the um, tax bill. So when you do comparisons between us and let's just say agency B, it, it's very hard to do a one-to-one -one comparison, because they might, for example, have some of their fixed costs on a tax bill that doesn't show up on their website. So you could be a customer of agency B, look at their rate schedule, and that portion that's on your tax bill doesn't show up on their website because they don't bill you monthly for that. The county will bill you annually for that. So as we go forward, I'm noticing more and more that it's really hard to compare to other agencies. Right now, all of BWD's bill um, is on their bill. It's on their monthly bill. So like I said, it, it's becoming harder to compare. I'm trying to do my best to try to see if we can get stuff from the tax bill. Um, but that's how, the, you know, that shows. So on our bill though, the average customer, go back one slide, Wes, just to put in perspective what 13 units of water per month is, 13 units of water a month is about nine, is 9,274 gallons per month. So the commodity portion is about $56 on that customer's bill. The fixed portion, RTS, which is ready to serve, which is the fixed portion, is about $36.55 for a total water-only portion of their bill of about $92. And that $92 equates to less than one cent per gallon of water for, the, for our rate payers. If you combine that with the $38.99 that the um, single family residence um, customer pays for their sewer, it comes to a total bill that they um, were paying of $131.41. So then we, what we do is we compare that to what we are budgeting um, in the budget document for the fiscal year and how that would affect the average single family residence. So their commodity portion would go up from about $2 from 55 to 57, excuse me, the ready to serve would go up about a dollar. So their total water only portion would go from 92.42 to 95.50. For the current fiscal year, 2021, there was no projected increase for the sewer. So their bill would still be about $39 for a total overall bill of $134 and about 50 cents. So that's an increase of about of $3.08 on the bill and go one more Wes. So you'll see that that $3.08 for just water only was about 3.3%. But if you combine that with the sewer portion, the total customer bill was projected to go up about 2.3%. So if we can go, I think that's the end on the customer bill. 
So for the water volume, the, the I'm sorry, for the water revenue combined, um, the total revenue for water is about $42.1 million. The majority of that, almost two thirds of it comes from the commodity portion. So the water units that we sell, about 14 and a half million of that is the fixed RTS or ready to serve portion of the bill, which is about a third of that. And the other 2% is miscellaneous revenue. It could be um, interest income. It could be lease income and sometimes some one-time um, items that come in. So that makes up our total water revenue. Now each year we also do a demand sensitivity analysis to show what the district's financial impacts would be if the demand would either increase or decrease by let's say five or 10%. So for example, if um, the demand was 10% less than what we budgeted, so in terms of COVID, we already put in uh, about a 10 to 15, about a 10%, uh, maybe five, I think it was about 5% overall demand decrease. So that's already built into the budget. But if the demand were to decrease an additional 10%, that would mean our net revenues, VWD's net revenues would be down almost one and a half million dollars. Conversely, and this is what we're seeing now, that demand is actually up. So if demand were to go up about 10%, which is probably what we're seeing compared to what we're budgeting, our net overall revenue would increase by about $1.6 million. And as Wes mentioned that these are money that are then put into the reserve that are used to pay for some, uh, most of our capital replacement projects. That's the end of the water portion. I think we have one more slide for sewer revenues. Now the sewer revenues are a little bit, are definitely more stable than water revenues. They're a lot easier to project. Um, because it's not, for the most part, it's not commodity based. And there were no rate changes proposed for fiscal year 2021. Our sewer service revenue is stable at about 17.3 million. That makes up about 86%. Our reclaimed sales, uh, Wes mentioned before that we uh, sell our, after we do the tertiary treatment, we sell the reclaimed water to Carlsbad and OMWD. That makes up about 14%. And the other revenue is the same as the other revenue for water. It's some interest expense, some minor one-time items, um, things like that. So I think that's the end that I have. If you have any um, general questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hey, Wes. Okay, <clears throat> so the next section we're gonna talk about, hey, hey, I'm not muted, look at that. Uh, <clears throat> next section we're gonna talk about is the, uh, the capital budget. And the capital budget makes up about 24 million or 20, 27% of the total overall budget. So we, for this current fiscal year is 24 million, uh, but we also do a five year and a 10 year projection and the 10 year projection ends up being $145 million. So I wanna take a look at the process and how we come about, how we get those numbers. So, uh, similar to the materials and services requests, every year, each department, every supervisor and manager uh, submits, they, they look at what they need for replacement projects or other capital projects, and they submit their requests on a capital project request page that looks a lot like this. Uh, and these are at the end of the budget too, from like page 80 to like 110 or something like that. Um, but this is just a sample of that, so you can see exactly what it looks like, so you don't need to reference it. Uh, again, not talking about numbers, just what's the, the content. So the description of the page really set, it names the project and, and uh, talks about uh, what it's going to be. <clears throat> then the project manager is listed. We assign it a project number and we talk about the funding source. In this case, it's funded by sewer replacement. And you can see that here under 100% 210. Uh, and then the next section is a detailed section of what the project is and why it's needed. And then we have the project spending plan uh, for the next five years, as well as the estimated project timeline from uh, design to completion. So that's the project request page. We take each one of these and there are always a lot of them and we put them into this page here. I know it's a lot of numbers, but again, I'm, I'm not really gonna be referring to numbers. I just wanna give you uh, the, the page from the budget. So this is page 34 and 35 from the budget. And you can see we list all of the projects. It also serves as sort of a table of contents. So you can see the page number on the left-hand side references the project. So if you're looking for a certain project, you can go there and go to the page for the project, but they're all listed. And we can see here that the total of the previous budget amounts. So for the prior year, were the 55.6, and that's what's left over and still being worked on this year. Then we look at what was spent on them each year. 
and then we have the carry forward or what we'll need to budget for in the next five to 10 years. And then each of those projects, we take a look at it and say, okay, is it still gonna cost the same or should we change the cost of that project? So there may be a new request and that new request may go up or down. Some of them are reduced in costs here. Uh, you can see $178,000 reduction, 330,000. Some of them are increased and those become new requests for the current uh, budget year. And that will come out to our project total for existing projects or carryover projects. To the right of that on page 34 and 35, we actually show the five-year spending plan. So we use this to project out for the next five years and then actually 25 and beyond as well, which would be the 10-year projection. Those feed our reserve pages, which I'll talk about in a minute for our, our five-year projection or reserve funding levels. <clears throat> and then here we can see, for example, the total budget for 2020 for carryover projects was 17 million and you have the five years going forward. And then the bottom part of that page on page 34 are the new projects. And you can see the new projects here. Those are new requests for that year, projects that didn't exist before. And we had about 28 of them last year. And the total of the new projects was $93 million um, for the total 10 year project budget of 145 million. But it's important to note that every year we get a five year plan from Messina. And because I'm, as I mentioned, we own about 23, 24% of capital, about 22% of uh, operations, it's a blended rate, but 24% of capital um, we have to budget for 24% of their five-year CIP plan. And that's typically, well, this year it was $29.9 million. So it's quite a bit of our new requests every year. So that's what the capital budget looks like summarized. Um, we take those project pages and summarize them. From there, we use this, as I mentioned, to go into the reserve balances. Uh, and we do that by taking the, a look at the five-year CIP costs. And here's sort of a summary of the five-year CIP costs. By water and sewer, the blue bars, the, the water, the red bars, the sewer. I put the green bar in there is just to show the, the Encina portion of it because Encina is actually a decent chunk of our sewer CIP costs. But <clears throat> if you look, the 145 million, excuse me, the 145 million is the total of that 38.9 is water and the majority of it again is sewer at 106 million. And of the sewer, $30.4 million of that is for Encina. Um, but another thing to note is that in the outer years, and you know, this year we've got $25 million in projects, we've got another 20 next year, but then going up to 23, 24, we have a good 35 million and another 28 million and 24, 25. So we've got some pretty um, expensive projects coming up in the future. So luckily we've actually funded for those and planned for those. And we've, our reserve levels look like they may be high currently where we've, we've talked about that, but that was planning for these future projects. So we expect to see those reserve levels come down and I'll talk about that in a second. So the next thing I wanna show you is the reserve balances. So this is how those projects feed into the, our five-year plan. This is the basically the reserve report. You see this every month in the board packet for the most part, but we use the same report to plan for the next five years. So you can see here at the top, we have the four funds. We have water replacement, water capacity, sewer replacement and sewer capacity. So what we do is we take the last year, the ending balance of last year as we project it. And then we take, and again, worth mentioning is that only replacement reserves are considered when looking at rates. So for the budget process, the most important thing are the replacement reserves. So taking a look at the water replacement, the 36.6 million was the beginning balance. From there, we add the estimated revenues such as property taxes, RDA pass-throughs uh, <clears throat> and transfers from operations. And then we did we uh, reduced that by the capital expenditures uh, for water replacement was $5.4 million this year. And that gives us our ending balance for 2021. We do that for each year for the next five years to get our five-year reserve balance plan to take a look at it and see uh, how our reserves will be funded, what our funding levels will be. And if we need to raise rates for replacement, for example, to fund future projects, it gives us that sort of broad uh, outlook. So <clears throat> this Graph here shows the reserve balances by water and sewer from 2014 projected through 2021. And you can say they've been increasing because we've been planning for these large projects we have coming up. Uh, so they, we've been increasing those levels, but in 2021 with the, the projects we have this year, we're expecting reserve levels to go down. And then if we look at it in a, a linear chart, uh, we can see that in 2020, uh, reserve levels were at 96 million. They were pretty close to the ceiling. And one thing I wanna mention here before I go into the levels, <clears throat> you can see there's a blue bar at the top, that's our reserve ceiling. Uh, the reserve ceiling 
is set at 10 years of replacement of existing uh, water and sewer capital assets. Uh, and the floor is set at three years for both water and sewer. And actually for sewer, the ceiling set at eight years, not 10 years, but combined, this is what we have. So, and those are set based on GFOA best practices and industry best practices. So we look at our actual capital assets, how much we, what we have in capital assets and what needs to be replaced over the next eight years, 10 years for the ceiling, and then three years for the floor. And our policy says that we have to maintain a minimum of at least three years of replacement of, of assets uh, for the floor. So in comparing those two, we can see that in 2020, we were at 96 million. So we were getting close to the ceiling, but as we had these new replacement projects, the reserve levels start to decrease. And by 2025, we expect them to be around 74 million, which is much closer to the, to the floor than it is to the ceiling, but it's still within policy limits. So that's how we do our five-year uh, projection and calculate our reserve balances. Um, <clears throat> that's pretty much my entire presentation and the overview of the budget process. Um, once we've done the five-year projection from, from there, we're, we're, we're done with our budget plan. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Hey, Wes, I don't know if you want, if you're going to cover this in future meetings, but, um, you know, you, you, you presented a, a, a very detailed uh, presentation tonight, and, but you focused a lot on parts of the budget that we couldn't control, right? Um, you know, water purchases, for example, in Cena. Um, are you going to cover in future meetings or can you do, if, if not, can you tonight kind of talk about some of the levers that the board does have to pull uh, that could impact uh rates either either you know positively or negatively depending on how you look at it <laughs> negative meaning rates going up right and uh so what you know what are some of the levers that we do have to pull on it you know rate stabilization labor those types of things or, unless you're going to cover that in a future meeting then we can just cover it then yeah i mean i hadn't really planned on, on talking about it but we can talk about it a little bit i mean the majority of what i did uh you know, and talking about the materials and services, those are the majority of our, I don't want to call it discretionary, but those are the items that we can look at. But for the most part, we try to reduce those as much as possible through this process. And, and I, I was hoping to kind of convey that is that, you know, by going through this six month, very detailed budget process, the board and staff have been very good at eliminating any unnecessary costs. So we make sure that we sort of pull all those levers uh, in order to keep rates as low as possible. Yeah, no, I, under, I understand, I mean, that you guys are going through, you know, you're trying to run the operation as efficiently as possible and trying to, uh, I guess, get the best prices on uh, the, the materials that you need and, and whatnot. But there are other levers for, I mean, we've talked about these in past meetings where if we so chose, we could, you know, use some of our reserves to, uh, to offset rate increases. And so we have other, other options that we can uh, uh, utilize if we have to may not necessarily always be advisable to do so, but it, it, but there, it's an option, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so typically you, you know, if you, rate stabilization doesn't occur unless you go over the ceiling, um, but if you elected to use reserves that were sort of designated for capital replacement, then you just have to sort of replenish that in the future. So there are levers that you could pull, pull like that, um, <clears throat> but you're right, they're not necessarily advisable. But uh, I think, you know, the, the committee and staff, and it's a big function of the finance committee, this is why we meet like eight times, is to really keep all of our costs low. And I think the committee does a great job and, you know, we work well together in keeping everything as low as possible and, and determining if we need to pull any of the levers or, or use reserves for things like that. But uh, we've also done some other things to reduce costs for the future and part of our planning. Uh, and this is the board as well as staff and, and pre-funding the PERS. Uh, by funding the PERS UAL, we saved $10 million, and that's keeping rates low. And, um, <clears throat> you know, funding OPEB as well, the other post-employment benefit, that's fully funded now. So that's another $400,000 a year that we saved. Um, and we did go through with the budget presentation, the sort of millions of dollars that these uh, good decisions have made and saved the money that saved our rate payers. And if I can add, in, in addition to the uh, conversation during the budget time frame, we can also have that conversation during rate setting because uh, that's really what will affect the, uh, the customers the most. So when we go through a cost of service study and consider adjustments to rates, we'll explore those alternatives. 
We'll first determine how much money we need to run the operation. And then we'll look into where those funds come from. Typically they come primarily from the ratepayers, but uh, Director Snell, you're right. If the board wanted to draw from some of our reserve balances to reduce the revenue requirement, we can certainly do that. But I think what, what Wes was trying to point out is that there's potential ramifications to that. So, and we'll share those with the board too. We can come forward with options and explain the, the pros and cons of whatever option we have. And then real quick, Wes, if you can go to that slide, it shows the budget for this fiscal year 2021 that shows that I think 610,000 was um, being funded out of reserves. Is that correct? Uh, we were reducing reserves by 610,000, yeah. Yeah. Let's see if I have it here. Yeah, so in a way that's drawing on reserves to keep the rate increases as low as possible. Right here. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah, we did that this year as a result of some of the COVID impacts COVID. and considerations. Yep. No, it's, it's just good to know. I mean, it's, it's as a board member, you know, it's, it sometimes is fr frustrating that so much of our budget is not really even controllable. So, um, you know, if you look at, I mean, the, the water purchases alone, what would you say, 70% uh, yeah. of our overall budget? I mean, that, I mean, there's, you know, that only leaves 30% left. <laughs> I mean, it really, it really ties our hands. And the other take, the, the other thing I'm glad that, uh, Glenn, that you mentioned about the, uh, the, um, the rate setting process too, because that was one of the kind of the big aha moments for me when I first got on the board was that, you know, being from the private sector, you know, we would typically look at, you know, the prior year revenue forecasts and contracts and everything else that we have for the upcoming year. And then we would basically set a budget and then push out, we would tell the business units, okay, this is your budget this year. Well, in the government side of things, you know, it was, it was a bit of a surprise to me when I learned that we would set the budget and then we would just set the rates based off of whatever we needed to meet the budget, right? And so that was a little bit different than what I was used to coming from the private sector. So um, once I learned that, and it took me like two years to figure it out, but once I learned it, um, you know, it, it really got me thinking that, that you really have to use the budget timing, time frame as an opportunity if you really want to try to do something with um, either, you know, keeping rates flat or, 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 or as low as possible, the budget's really the opportunity to do it because once you get, when, once, once the budget's passed, then, you know, the rates are going to be whatever the rates are in order to, in order to fund it. And so, um, and, and again, that just adds to the frustration that, so much of what of our budget, uh, we really can't do much with. All right, is, is that all that staff have? Yeah, I yep. think that's, that's all we had. And uh, Director Boyd Hodgson, I don't know if you had anything, but while you think about that, one thing, uh, and maybe I'll looking at you, Director Sanella, one thing I may recommend is that staff spend a little bit of time with our two new directors in some kind of a it won't be a finance committee meeting. I'll just set up some meetings to be able to give them an opportunity to raise their level of understanding of our budget. Um, because I think there's probably better use of our time in the finance committee to be looking forward and still give the two new directors the opportunity to be um, have their knowledge level accelerated as much as possible. So I guess I would look to both of you, both of you right now in the finance committee to see if that's agreeable to both of you that we would set up some separate meetings with the two new directors. I think that's a great idea. Um, what is the process, and maybe it happens in the finance committee, I'm not sure, but what is the process of, you know, because obviously this budget was drafted and I wasn't part of that drafting process, but what's the process by which I can go through this budget between now and the time that it's presented for approval and have discussions about, well, what if we did this? And what if we did that? And what if we did this? What, what, what does that look like? Well, clearly being on the finance committee, that gives you kind of an inside, inside look at that. Um, when I say inside look, you'll see a lot of the detailed information before the non-finance committee members of the board will see them. So if you have concerns, whether it's at a finance committee meeting or in these separate meetings I'm talking about with you and Director Pennock, or just one-on-one -on -one between you and I, and maybe we can pull Wes in, you're gonna have every opportunity you want to ask the questions because we want to make sure that each director is comfortable when we bring the uh, budget forward for adoption. 
So I, I think the best thing for you to do is get comfortable with the process of how we set it. And then obviously pay attention when we have these uh, budget development meetings kind of going forward. And then whenever you have questions, bring them up. I can't always guarantee that we'll have the ability to provide instantaneous answers to your questions, but I can guarantee we'll get back to you with good information if we can't provide it in real time at the meetings. Okay, that sounds good, thank you. Yeah, Glenn, I, and I agree. I, I think uh, having the kind of the more of the overall orientation type type of meetings with uh, Director Pennick and Director Boyd, Hod Boyd, Hod Boyd, Hod excuse me, Boyd Hodgson um, would be uh, beneficial and also would allow us to focus because we got we got a, you know this spring we got another a new budget coming up right so so we're going to have a lot to talk about during the finance meeting so um, uh, so yeah that'll keep us kind of focused there too. Yeah, so I shared this. So what we're going to be doing is, you know, probably in March, I imagine, we'll be setting up a finance committee meeting to kick off, uh, well, it'll be February, kick off the budget process. So that'll be the first meeting that we start, about, start getting input from the committee on, you know, budget details. We'll look at uh, budget versus actual, and then we'll start talking about materials and services. So that's the first section where we'll get the, the committee's input. And Director Boyd Hodgson, that's when you'll be able to start um, letting us know what you'd like to see. Yeah, and before we have those meetings, we'll be sending you packets of information well in advance of the meeting so that you can look through the numbers that you'll be seeing. You'll be able to look through the information in advance for what you'll be seeing at the uh, Finance Committee meetings. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. So the process really goes materials and services, then we look at salaries and benefits, capital budget requests, and then like the, the long range planning. And each one of those sections will have one or two, um, at least committee meetings. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Wes and Mike for putting this information together and presenting it tonight. Uh, very uh, informative and valuable. Appreciate it. Everybody, uh, what, I guess one last time, uh, happy holidays to everybody and, and enjoy uh, hopefully some time with your families. And I guess we'll be talking Thank in the new year. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wes and Glenn and staff. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, happy holidays. Take care. Bye-bye.